Hello, everyone. I'm John McKay. I'm the uh, member of Parliament for Scarborough Guildwood, and my uh, guest today is Ann Gloger from the East Scarborough storefront, uh, frequently referred to by me as Scarborough's number one saint. Um, Anne is uh, uh, Anne has been working in the East Scarborough area for many years. I'm thinking that almost as many years as uh, I have been working here. Um, and uh, does really quite extraordinary work. So, but before we get to the East Scarborough storefront, I want to uh, hear a few things about you. And I think because you know, I see you, I meet you, we talk about various things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but I don't know you. So let's start at the beginning. Where were you born? I was born in Scarborough. Where about? Um, I grew up at Brimley and Lawrence. Brimley and Lawrence. Brimley oh, really. and Lawrence Thompson That's Thompson Thompson almost as good as Scarborough Gildwood. Almost, almost as good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and where did you go to school? Well, I went to school. I went to early grade school at Donwood Park Public School and late high school to uh, David and Mary Thompson. And in between, I went to the Toronto Waldorf School. The Toronto Waldorf School. What's Toronto that? Toronto Waldorf School. It's a private school in Thornhill. It believes in holistic education, lots of nature, lots of art, lots of collaboration. Um, uh, it was in the middle of um, woods and farmers' fields up in Thornhill, which are now subdivisions. But mm -hmm. um, huh. yeah, so I got to have that experience. Um, and this middle. this has got nothing to do with your ability to make a good salad. No. No. Oh, no. <laughs> Although I believe they are both named after the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. Oh, really? Really? So that, I think oh, that's kind of that. interesting. Yeah. Oh well, there's a point of trivia for you. So you came <laughs> back from the the Waldorf School and came to Do David and Mary. I right? went to David and Mary Thompson. I see. Now, did you graduate when there was a grade thirteen? I graduated from grade 12 when there was a grade 13. Yeah. Um, little known uh, fact about me is that I was going to be a career waitress. Was uh, my, that was my ambition yeah, leaving high yeah. school. Um, hmm. So I didn't go back to college and then later university until later in my 20s. I uh, traveled and um, had fun. For a few years so, in between. So you didn't appreciate the entire joys of being a waitress then? I did. I loved it at the time until I got really, really tired. Yeah. It's hard, hard physical work. It is. It is. <laughs> I can remember my son and daughter did it for a while. I think they did it actually in Australia. And um, and uh, they they concluded that probably school was a better alternative after yes. <laughs> afterwards. So, yes, so you came back from your wanderings around the world. Where did you end up going around the world? Uh, it was actually around the country mostly. Oh, okay. Um, oh. I I went out to the west coast eventually, spending some time in Medicine Hat, Canmore, Banff. Um, mm -hmm. Spent several months in Vancouver. And um, yeah, then I came back and I went to Centennial College. So I came back to Scarborough, went to Centennial College for early childhood education. Really? Isn't yes. that interesting? I, I, we had one of these uh, interviews with uh, Craig Stevenson, the, pre the current president of Centennial College. Yeah. And uh, he was telling us that Centennial College has the highest satisfaction rate of all of the colleges in the greater GTA area, which I thought was really quite interesting. So it's arguably the best college in an entire GTA area. And here it is in our backyard and we don't necessarily appreciate it. Yes, I loved it. I loved it. It really taught me. I always tell uh, the people that I work with there at the storefront that everything I learned about working with people, I learned in early childhood education school. It really <laughs> opened up my mind yeah. to how people react to yeah. different things like instruction and criticism and things mm. like that. Well, that's why you get along so well with all your politicians. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> early childhood education. <laughs> that's the ticket, eh? That's the ticket. Who knew? So, so you graduated from uh, Centennial. So did you go into early childhood education? I did. Um, I taught. Um, 
well, first in Scarborough um, at uh, Metro Daycares. I moved around to all the different daycares in in mm. Scarborough Guildwood. A lot of them in at Scarborough Guildwood, Galloway, Lawrence East. They're all still there. Yeah. Um, and then I taught on Toronto Island for a while mm -hmm. um, at the um, Gibraltar Point Day Nursery. Yeah. And then I decided to go back to university because I love this thing about people so much. So I mm -hmm. took a social development degree at University of Waterloo. So I moved to Waterloo for a while where mm -hmm. I did more early childhood education, got my degree at the same time. Um, worked in, at the YWCA in mm -hmm. Kitchener for eight years. And I realized that if I really wanted to make a distant difference, I needed to know a ton about people, but I also needed to know a lot about business. I needed to know about how to get things done in the world, as well as how to work with people. So I went back to Wilfrid Laurier uh, for business. Oh, really? Yeah. And uh, yes, so hmm. that was- So, so uh, where was, it, was that an MBA? No, no, it was a, a postgraduate diploma. On oh, top okay, of yeah. 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 Oh. Oh. Um, and then my father was very sick in Scarborough. So I came back, uh, moved back here, hmm. um, worked at the 519 for a while. Um, and then I always tell the story at the storefront. I answered an ad in the Toronto Star, a two line tiny ad. Most job recruitment had gone online. The, the, the you know, help wanted ad in the, in the Toronto Star had really, really dwindled, but there was this tiny two-line ad looking for someone to take on a $5,000 contract for a collaborative in East Scarborough. A collaborative? And What's a collaborative? A collaborative. A group, we, well, at that point, it was 40 different organizations trying to figure out how do you bring a ton of services to East Scarborough with no money? It was uh -huh. basically the... Uh, um, the gist of how it all started. And um, so I applied and I took this little $5,000 gig to turn mm. their dreams uh, into something practical. So yeah. that was when we opened the storefront at Morningside Mall. Oh, I remember that Morningside yeah. Mall. Yes, yeah, yes. I got a picture of you at the opening. So oh, really? My 20, goodness. Y 20 <laughs> years ago. Yeah. Well, I didn't have my COVID haircut then. <laughs> yeah. Me either. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, twenty years ago at the at the Morningside Mall, I remember that. Gee, that was it. That I really liked your location there. I thought it was a great location, good uh, good access, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, and up on the second floor, um, you had the uh, escalator access right right to your front door, literally to your front door. Um, so um, I know after that. Um, so, so this five thousand uh, dollar gig <laughs> led to um, you becoming the chief cheese of the East Scarborough storefront. Is that and uh, so you are the, uh, uh, the the founder, the uh, the patron saint, uh, like the uh, yes, yes, <laughs> pretty well everything that, uh, that can be imagined. Well, yes, I help everybody bring it all together. This is yeah. not a one person show by any stretch of the imagination. So, um, yes, a little trouble with the saint status. Um, yeah, yeah. But I've had. Well, we, to... do, we do have a category for secular saints, by the way. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that makes you feel better. Yeah. yeah. But it's really, you know, it's been thousands of residents and, and hundreds of organizations that have just contributed to it over time. And I, you know, I characterized myself as a bit of an orchestra conductor, mm. you know, mm -hmm. that um, the whole premise of the East Scarborough storefront is people work better together mm -hmm. um, and people work better together when there's somebody orchestrating and coordinating and convening people so that they're having the right conversations at the right time um, to solve whatever problems before them. So that's really been my work for the last 20 years. So if, if I'm a, a resident of Mars or downtown Toronto, which is equally, uh, uh, equally uh, foreign, uh, and I walked in your front door, how would you describe what you were doing 20 years ago with pre-COVID, we will go to pre-COVID, what you were doing um, pre-COVID in, in February or March of this year. So 20 years ago was the premise of how do you create a space for 
35 different organizations to come on an itinerant basis and bring their specific service to the community. Mm -hmm. So that was the entirety of the work, what is now known as a service hub. That was new language at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that's gone strong ever since. We still have 35 organizations when it's not COVID uh, coming in and out and using the space in a really coordinated way so that when someone walks in the door, they can get pretty much any service that they need, whether they, you know, kind of understand the dynamics in the background or not is kind of irrelevant because they could get legal advice or settlement service or employment help or a youth group or whatever it is that they're looking for because we have orchestrated this process for a whole bunch of organizations to do that in one space. We realized that this kind of approach of orchestrating it so people can work really easily collaboratively had all kinds of other implications. So while the service hub is still going strong, um, resident-led groups and supporting residents to work together to do everything from theater groups to cooking groups to um, uh, youth discussion forums. Uh, we are able to use the kind of the same orchestration approach with them to be able to get the best out of the resources and capacity that already exists in the community. So you're, so, you're in effect the ultimate networker. That's exactly what it is. It's, uh, there's, there's actually a whole discipline behind it called network weaving methodology. Oh, really? It's written on it. <laughs> yeah, it is actually a thing. Uh -huh. um, and that's what we do. Um, and as you know, kind of our most recent uh, use of what we call the connected community approach has been workforce development. And mm. how when there's massive amounts of uh, spending happening in the backyards of people living um, below the low income cutoff, how do you actually orchestrate all the training, wraparound supports, uh, union entrance, uh, apprenticeships, essential skills and literacy, how do you orchestrate everybody who's expert in all those to help people actually qualify for and attain those jobs? Yeah, and so yeah. we use exactly the same methodology, but we're using it in the context of uh, workforce development and employment. Well, it, it's interesting to me that uh, in Scarborough Guildwood, uh, the um, poverty is there and it is real, uh, but it is a little bit hidden. It's not always manifest, but when you go to government statistics, it's really there. Yeah. And, um, and what, uh, what uh, people don't appreciate is that Scarborough Guildwood is the number one beneficiary of the Canada child benefit in the country. Yes. That's a hundred million dollars coming into the riding every year. And this was pre COVID. Yes. Um, so I have no idea what's coming in now uh, as, um, as financial support. No. to um, to folks. Uh, I'm sure that there will be dissertations and papers and et cetera, et cetera, um, which leads me to a, a question that I think you are uniquely um, in a position to answer, and, uh, and I'm assuming you've thought about it, and that is um, we are tiptoeing down the path of a guaranteed income. Um, and uh, the you know the the Canada Emergency Benefit uh, looks like a guaranteed income, smells like a guaranteed income, feels like a guaranteed income, might even be a guaranteed income, but I don't think it's going to be guaranteed for much longer. Right. So, um, g give me uh, your assessment of of that methodology as a way in which to deliver. Uh, much needed social uh, social and economic stability to the, the population. Yeah. So the first thing that comes to mind for me when we talk about guaranteed income is reduction of societal anxiety. Hmm. So with a guaranteed income, it's the, the putting food on the table and paying, paying the rent is Okay, I know I can do the basics. Mm -hmm. And the idea I was thinking about, you know, this conversation that people have about, well, if there's a guaranteed income, no one will want to work. 
And, you know, I kind of want to want to turn that on its head a little bit, because I think we create jobs that are poorly paid with not great working conditions, with not a lot of uh, security or, or support for people working in them. And people will take them because they're desperate. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps people won't want to take really crappy jobs if they have the basics covered because they won't be desperate enough to have to do it. And does that actually spur us on to create better jobs, better working conditions, so that people's natural tendency to want to contribute to society will, can, will be there and would they will be able to use it when they're in, when they're or, on or even awesome. have the same crappy job but at least the paycheck isn't as crappy at least the paycheck well decent work has all kinds of dimensions right one is yeah. that it, it pays decently and you know i mean it depends so much on the design um but you know there there was um an experiment and i'm going to lose where it was it was somewhere in manitoba it was in the 70s i was just reading about it where they set out to prove the idea that people want to work despite the fact that they have a guaranteed income. Mm. And the only people whose work hours actually decreased were people, uh, stay-at-home moms who could actually stay at home, or parents who could actually stay at home with their kids, um, and students who could actually focus on their schoolwork. For everybody else, work hours actually didn't diminish. And when you look at the number of, you know, Storefront has any given year, has 450 plus volunteers. It's not that wow. people don't want to work. No, they want to be yeah, interacting. And that's, that's actually a, a phenomenon that's observable in this COVID period. People, people just want to do things. Uh, we were up at uh, UTSC and... Um, and Global Medic was uh, organizing some um, packaging of uh, dry goods, and um, and uh, they were saying they they've got amazing number of people want to uh, volunteer. Just get me out of the house and get me doing something, if nothing else. Uh, so. Yeah. So I think me, pe people's lives have meaning when they contribute. And so mm -hmm. I think that that's a whole false assumption with the um, guaranteed income that people would just laze around the house. We're seeing that now. People don't want to do that. Yeah. Well, we're going to have uh, that um, theory tested big time, um, probably by the end of the summer, where uh, I am, and I don't know this, but I suspect that the government will start to wind back the emergency benefit and all of the other uh, emergency lifelines have been put out in this, in this um, pandemic. So, um, uh, well, we're going to, what, what did you think? I think um, the, the liberal government, um, the, the, the provincial liberal government had um, three test sites, one in Hamilton, one in Lindsay, and mm -hmm. I've forgotten where the other one was. Um, and I thought that there was um, some success with those things. And then the, the current government came in and axed the whole thing. Um, yeah, that's my understanding as well, and I haven't done a deep dive into those particular examples, um, and I don't think it was in place long enough to actually get the data that they needed to prove, um, you know, the outcomes. I think yeah. it, was only in, it was only in place for a little over a year, I think, but yeah. um, early learnings were sim sim certainly um, that whole thing about anxiety reduction. I don't think we can underplay it. I mean, the level of anxiety in our communities, um, you know, causes mental distress, um, causes dysfunction of all kinds. And if we can do something so that we're, we're lessening the anxiety of people, society as a whole will benefit. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really solid point. Uh, it's not necessarily measurable, but it's, it is a solid point. And when people are, are anxious, they don't make good decisions. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and that's one of the things with this uh, pandemic is you wonder whether it's a pandemic or it's a panic demic, um, yes. yeah, because people are just freaked out about uh, about not only their health but also their their economic well being. But um, so let me uh, just um, move the conversation to um, the notion that or, or the, the reality you had to you had to pivot your organization had to pivot. Um, in March, um, and uh, what did you do, and how's it worked out? 
Well, we are a community building organization. So obviously in person is, you know, a lot of the value that we bring to the community. The sense of belonging, the sense of agency, the place where you can go to get what you need, um, the collective, you know, so that, you know, that's, that's our ethos. So um, we're doing so much better than I expected to. If you had told me a year ago that Storefront would have to go to an online reality, I would have been really, really skeptical. The team has been phenomenal. When we started out, um, the, we heard right away that there was way too much information. Nobody knew who to, who to trust, what to trust, how to get information, whatever. Um, so knowledge mobilization be became our key work at the beginning. The really taking information from government sites and from nonprofits and so on, uh, making it super accessible, easy to get, easy to understand and getting it out there. From the get-go, we have been talking to um, upwards of 2,000 people a month. Then one of the first things we did was said, someone's got to answer our phone, mm -hmm. right? See, the immediate go-to place was put it on, a, on an answering machine. But, you know, again, the anxiety of people, the feel people feeling uh, isolated and not supported. So we started transferring the phone every day. We have a staff who goes in every day and has to manually transfer the phone to somebody's cell phone. So when you call the storefront, someone will pick up. Mm -hmm. We've been told, um, over and over and over again, what a difference that makes. That they use That's about the phone. simplest thing you can do. It's <laughs> the simplest thing you can do, but yeah. what a difference it has made because yeah. people don't just want information. Yeah, they want information, but they want to be reassured. And, uh, um, and a voicemail, leaving a voicemail is not Doesn't got it. Re Doesn't got reassuring. It. Yeah. Um, so talking, we're phoning. We phone anyone we've got a phone number for, we're phoning. We're phoning constantly, hmm. um, checking in and seeing how people are doing. And um, we're collecting data on what is it that people people need. And I can sort of tell you the trajectory that it has gone. So in the first um, days and weeks, it was a combination of health information and food. How do I get food? What do I trust? What do I do? What are the rules? And then very quickly turned into where can I get financial help? Right, we yeah. spent a lot of time on CERB and making sure that people had access to the information that they needed to, in order to be able to qualify for that. We've also done work, some work with business, local businesses and the things that they can qualify for. Um, once that kind of wound down, most people had access to what they needed. It became isolation, mental health and taxes. So a lot All of right. the, the, you know, getting your taxes filed because that's a big piece of what we do. We orchestrate volunteers with Wood Green um, uh, Community Services to do people's taxes locally, and we do you know upwards of 500 um, tax claims in about a month normally. And well, and, and if ironically, if ever there was a year to file your taxes, this is it. This because is it. The, the government relies upon your filing to uh, to determine whether you're entitled to your HST refund, and the HST refund has been a significant component of the support. That's right. Similarly with similarly with your landlord tenant situation, if in fact you are a commercial tenant, um, if you don't have a business number, or if you don't have the the uh, the, the registrations, you're toast. You that's right. You don't qualify. You don't qualify. So uh, it's 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 interesting that uh, that tax filing might be the most important social service that you provide. And yet we were unable to do it. There were all kinds of problems with volunteers working with people on phones, like the security and all these kinds oh. of kinds of things. Hmm. Um, many of our partners are, have slowly begun to figure it out. Um, and so we are able to connect people. We're not the tax experts as, you know, our role is the convening and the connecting. So, you know, we're getting there with that. And then um, the, the, the resident groups, the grassroots groups have been phenomenal. So that piece about social, social isolation, um, feeling helpless, all that kind of thing. There's a group, a youth group called AC, the Association for Committed and Engaged Youth. Um, that have been hosting weekly um, 
both serious discussions and alternating that with games and talent shows and you know music events all online and so that mm -hmm. um hanging it which is an open forum for people to um bring ideas initiatives it's it's a group that meets once every two weeks there's less connectivity there but they're meeting they're meeting all the time not quite sure how often i think it's about once a week mm -hmm. by phone because there's no connectivity. We've been trying desperately to push for um, universal access to, um, to decent internet. So Toronto Community Housing has access to internet, but it's not strong enough to support Zoom meetings. So imagine oh. doing all this without being able to do Zoom calls. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've been working with the library. We've got 50 hotspots from Toronto Public Library that are going out in the next couple of weeks, which are, you know, not what I have in that they don't support video and it, to the extent that what I do does, uh, what I have does, but um, hopefully, fingers crossed, they'll be able to support Zoom for particularly for the grassroots leaders who are trying to help other residents but are having trouble convening and talking about it because of connectivity. So in the past three months, you've gone from a, uh, a physical convening, a physical networking to a virtual convening, a virtual networking. Yep. And I'm, and, and, uh, and let me make this uh, the, the penultimate question. So if we were talking a uh, year from now, um, where do you see the East Scarborough storefront and how do you see it doing what it does best, which is connecting people? Well, certainly I see our role in workforce development being critical to economic recovery. Um, mm. Stimulus spending coming from yeah. federal government. How do we make sure that that is reaching the people in communities that are usually quite far away from the labor market. And you and I have talked about this before, mm -hmm. by knowing in advance the actual skills and actual jobs and by having relationships with the unions who are going to be um, on those jobs and by being able to convene the right trainers for the right people at the right time and be able to do the outreach to get the people with aspiration and aptitude for those specific jobs. That's our work. And I think that the stimulus spending um, will provide some real opportunity there if we can get it right if we can mm. you know get the relationships and so you know uh, you talked about university of toronto scarborough earlier and we have a, a wonderful um uh, relationship with them and they're going forward with they've got the new resident build coming i believe shovels in the ground december ish is the general general uh, thinking and we've got people preparing for that right now. I was, I was going to ask you that because I, I think that was our last conversation about um, making sure that uh, if um, if there are um, infrastructure projects that the first choice goes to people who are able in the in the uh, East Garber area. So uh, are you pleased with that project? We are very pleased with that project. We're pleased with the relationships with the UTSC, with uh, Layuna, a key union. Um, on that project, um, the trainers and social network is all in place. We actually, um, so prior to, just prior to COVID, mm. we had deployed a network of residents to work their own networks to find the right people for these jobs. So, you know, we talked about before yep. the idea of come one, come all, here's a job fair, um, is not very specific. And all you right. tend to get a lot of people who are coming who really don't have any interest in the jobs or, or aptitude for that kind of work or whatever. So we had 60 people come to a really amazing info session with Lyuna and UTSC and the other trainers to explore the possibility of these jobs. Um, it was left up to all the individuals. If you still think after this information session, this is the right job for you, you call us. Mm. So 28 mm. people called us. 28 out of 60. Wow. 28 out of 60. So we have 20, 28 on a pathway, 11 of whom are just steps away from being ready. Wow. Mm. Then COVID hit. 
<laughs> so it's not quite as ready because yeah. there were connectivity issues and childcare issues and whatever in terms of the, the getting ready for La Una. So I'm not sure that the, the first intake will have all those 11 we intended it to. It will likely be less, but La Una is ready. We're all, all ready. It's all, hmm. the pathway is in place. Okay. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, not having COVID would help a lot, but um, we're, we are ready. And so other builds in East Scarborough, we now don't have to do a lot of the back end work because we're already, we're already you, there. You've got a level of credibility. Yeah. 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 And, hmm. um, you know, it's not just construction. It's all the jobs associated with construction, too. Sure. So, yeah. Um, I'm very optimistic that this will be a very um, timely uh, piece of work post COVID. Um, the other thing is going to be, you know, really um, rebuilding a sense of trust in systems. We work a lot under the, you know, sort of the framing of resilience mm -hmm. and, you know, this in resilience language um, is, you know, a major shock. And I think, that each individual body responded exceptionally well in this shock. So the nonprofits, government, governments, um, uh, residents, they weren't necessarily connected and coordinated in a way <laughs> we would like to have seen. Trauma so will do think, that to you. <laughs> yeah, indeed. And so, and, and the underlying stresses. So when you talk about resilience, you talk about resilient, uh, you talk about stresses and shocks. The mm -hmm. underlying resilience are the inequities we see in the city, that what you were talking about poverty in East Scarborough, not necessarily really um, a lot of attention being being brought to it, and things like transit, right? Housing, transit, um, employment; those things um, are exacerbated by this. The uh, you know lack of transit, you know, the uh, talking about TTC reducing transit service. Well, yep. East Scarborough had pretty pitiful we, transit we had, service to begin with. <laughs> we didn't need any reductions. <laughs> My um, so those challenges are going to really be um, amplified coming yep. out of COVID yep. and how yep. we work together both to mitigate those ongoing stressors, but to prepare better for the next shock because yeah. there will be one, whether it's climate related or health related, there will be another shock and we need to keep working as a community to figure out how to, how to deal with it. Well, I'm gonna have to leave it there. Uh, time is the enemy in all of these conversations. Um, I've been talking to uh, Ang Gloger, uh, the ultimate networker of uh, Scarborough. And um, I, I, I think that, um, there will be a lot of people who would love to have your Rolodex, Anne. Um, I don't know whether you could ever auction it off. <laughs> uh, but big. this is uh, this has been a really interesting series of chats with people who are doing extraordinary things for with uh, extraordinary organizations um, that the average person doesn't know a thing about, and um, and so it's my happy little uh, task to try and. Um, bring um, a lot of these extraordinary people and extraordinary organizations to the attention and consciousness of the people who benefit from uh, from it. We have a world-class university in our backyard. We have a world-class college in our backyard. We have the, the Scarborough Health Network um, in our backyard, third largest health network in all of Ontario. Um, we have world-class East Scarborough storefront. We have a world-class East Scarborough uh, Boys and Girls Club. Uh, just extraordinary people doing extraordinary things. So with that, and I thank you for, uh, for joining me for this uh, chat, and we're going to have to do it again. Thanks this again. This is such a great initiative, John. Thank you so much for inviting me. Okay.